A date which will live in infamy. Both of those projects, initiatives, got off the ground because of the Gare River. Out of the 24 who were killed were Americans who had come to learn in Kevin. I say one million Jewish children who were made to be cut in Lusa. Whoever heard such beautiful words, It is never too little, it is never too late, and it is never enough. Jewish History Soundbites, bringing alive the world of our glorious past. Here is our host, live from Jerusalem, Jewish historian and tour guide, who the Gabber with Jewish History Soundbites, and this week's episode, in honor of last week, was Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Day here in Israel, and it's the 80th anniversary during these weeks. It's a month-long anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and it was also just Pesach now, the 80th yard site of Rav Menachem Zemba, the last Rav in Varsha of Warsaw, who was killed during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So this episode has been generously sponsored by Rona Holzer, hoping for peace for Eretz Yisrael and for all of Klal Yisrael, wherever they live and within his family. So why we're returning to the topic of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, I've covered it in previous episodes way back in the day, and, and it seems to be something that everyone talks about and is familiar with. So why would Jewish history soundbites go back to this topic? Because I found over time, over the last couple of years, that there's still so many misunderstandings of the facts, a lot of mixing politics with history, a lot of still pushing agendas, a lot of still being stuck in the 1950s discourse, ideological discourse and political discourse, and a lot of Israeli politics and nationalism mixed in as well, and anti-nationalism mixed in as well. We have the Warsaw Ghetto. Is the It's the largest... A ghetto in Nazi-occupied Europe. There's um, nearly half a million Jews at its peak inside the Warsaw, crammed into the Warsaw Ghetto. They're awful conditions. Close to 100,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto die from the conditions of the ghetto even before the, without the de- deportations. Um, one of the one of the things one of the reasons I want to return to the story of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising is because last time I spoke about it I mispronounced deportation and now I pronounce it correctly so that's another reason to get back to it. In any event, so even without the deportations, so the the, the nearly a hundred thousand Jews die of the day-to-day life conditions in the ghetto, which are impossible, nearly impossible to live by. Typhus spreads and other diseases and malnutrition, There's starvation. It's awful, awful conditions. That's, that's, and, and they're overcrowded and no hygiene. Um, and this is the largest by far. I mean, this is more more than twice the size of the second largest ghetto, which is Ludge and and way, way bigger than, than other big famous ghetto. The Vilna ghetto had... I don't know, 60,000 Jews there, and that was one of the largest ghettos, right? Uh, the Lublin ghetto had 30, 40,000 Jews. That was one of the larger ghettos. So you're talking about nearly a half a million Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. There's nothing in Nazi-occupied Europe that even comes close to the size of the massive Warsaw Ghetto. And of course, it's Warsaw. It's also the center of Jewish life. It was the capital of the Jewish world before the war. Um, in every way, religious, economics, politics, um, education. This is the center of Jewish life. So this is the big story. This is where everything happens. And it's very important to understand that context and the death rates and the conditions of the ghetto. And that all con- you know, continues. There's an attempt to maintain some sort of semblance of normalcy within the horrifying conditions of the ghetto. And that all continues until the gross actia, the great deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto in the summer of 1942. July 23rd, 1942, which is Tisha B'Av 
um, ironically, uh, uh, Tisha B'av, uh, 1942, the deportation begins from the Umschlagplatz, uh, the gathering grounds that the Nazis, the SS, uh, gather the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, day by day over the course of the next two months. Um, and during those two months, nearly 300,000 Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto are deported to Treblinka. Treblinka is, of course, a death camp. In other words, there's no survivors. It's all straight to the gas chambers. There's no selectia. There's no there's no labor. There's just a couple of hundred Jews in the Zunderkommando, the special task force who operates the gas chambers and and and, and sorts out the belongings of the victims. But um, but it's a death camp, so everyone goes straight to the gas chambers. This is the final solution, the extermination of Polish Jewry, and that's what happens to the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto during the summer of 1942. Now, what remains of the Warsaw Ghetto after that, after all the ones who had died in the ghetto, and after all this great deportation, so less than 60,000 Jews remain in the Warsaw Ghetto, which is, is a still significant number, but, um, but it's a shadow of its former self. And what these, the ones that remain are kept for labor, for slave labor. And, and they are meant to be temporarily kept for slave labor until the SS are ready to, to deport the remainder um, whenever they see fit. Uh, in January 1943, the SS attempt to deport another shift to Treblinka. And by this time, there is a resistance in the ghetto. There is armed resistance. And there, there's an exchange of fire, a short mini-revolt, we'll call it, in January 1943. And the deportation then comes to a quick close. It, 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 it stopped. Um, whether it stopped because of the armed resistance or not is still a topic debated by historians. But the resistance definitely understood that it was stopped because of, of them, because of the armed resistance. And then life continues in for whatever remained of the Warsaw Ghetto. It's less than 60,000 that are left. Um, in February 1943, it's important to understand what's going on in World War II. Uh, Stalingrad, uh, the, the Sixth Army is surrounded and surrenders in February 1st, 1943. So now the German army is in retreat. Why is that important? Because the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto heard about that. And they know right now that Germany is going to lose the war. Until Stalingrad, no one was sure if Germany would lose the war. Now everyone knows for certain that the Red Army is going to be victorious. The Germany, the German Wehrmacht is in full retreat. Um, and the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto knew about that. They heard from their contacts in the Polish resistance and clandestine radios. Now, the, the SS also knows that. And they want to clean out Poland before the Red Army arrives from any remaining Jews. So there's the final stages of Operation Reinhard, the extermination of Polish Jewry, in the General Gouvernement, which was the name that the, uh, the occupying Nazi authorities gave to Central Poland. And all the ghettos of Central Poland were to be liquidated, the final liquidation of any remaining ghettos in central Poland, General Gouvernement. And that's an important term that I'm going to get back to because Ludge is not in the General Gouvernement and had a different status. And therefore, the ghetto there had a, a different status and is not comparable to the SS plans for Warsaw and other ghettos in central Poland, which we'll get to shortly as well. So they plan for the final liquidation of the ghetto, which um, which is going to take place in April. Now, in the meantime, the resistance becomes more organized. Um, they prepare for revolt. They take over the ghetto, essentially, by force. The Judenrat becomes obsolete. Um, any other ghetto leadership becomes obsolete. The resistance takes over control of the ghetto, um, and they, they try to buy um, weapons on the black market. They extort money from Jews in the ghetto to buy weapons, which is a controversial move because many people are saving that money to buy food, to save whoever's left and, uh, and other things. And here they're extorting money, sometimes even at like gunpoint, to buy arms on the black market, to buy arms from the Polish resistance and from other, um, from other uh, means. Um, but they, they, they take control of the ghetto. The resistance fighters are divided into two groups, the ZOB, the main fighting force, which is composed of communists, 
um, the original uh, ones who established the the uh, j- fighting force were Jewish communists, Pinchas Karten, until he was killed in May 1942, and then um, the Bund, the the Yiddishists, the Bund, um, and the Labor Zionists, um, and several other groups. Then there was the ZZW, another fighting group, and they were the revisionist Zionists and and other other ad hoc groups that attached themselves either to the ZZW or fought independently. They were headed the ZZW was headed by Pavel Frankel. The ZOB was headed by Mordechai Anilevich, a a Shomer Hatzair uh, Zionist. Uh, the, his deputies, one of them was. Marek Edelman, a Bundist, and each one had their, they're all young people in their teens, 20s, um, and the the fighting for, by the way, religious Jews, Hasidim, who joined the fighting, and there were several, quite you know, a significant number of them, they generally joined the ZZW, the revisionist Zionist one, they were more receptive to having religious Jews joining their ranks as fighters, uh, so that generally took place, or they fought independently entirely. Um, in their in their own in their own little groups. Either way, the fighters probably number. We don't know. We don't have fi- you know. We don't know for sure. But they probably numbered around a thousand fighters, possibly a drop less. Um, and uh, and that was it. So what was the rest of the the sixty thousand members of the ghetto, the Jewish members of the ghetto? What did they do? They prepared for the, deep, the eventual deportation as well by hiding, by building an intricate uh, underground bunker system, which the Nazis and the SS would never be able to hide. So they were very active in the resistance. Uh, is, as, far as, as far as a historian is concerned, that's active resistance. That's not passivity. This did not take place, and I want to emphasize this. This did not take place in the summer before. There was no intricate bunker system in the great deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto the summer before. This only happened in, in the for, leading up to the final liquidation of the ghetto, and the reason is obvious, because now everyone knew what Treblinka was. Now everyone knew where they were going to be headed when the final liquidation was to take place, the final deportations from the Warsaw Ghetto would take place. They knew they were going to be killed. All hope was lost. There was a sense of desperation in the ghetto, and they were going to do everything they can to prevent it. Most did it by building bunkers underground, and then there was the few who did it by preparing for armed resistance, for fighting. Um, and and essentially, they were helping one another, right? They, they, by 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 not coming out when the when the when the SS came into the ghetto, when by by being hidden away in bunkers where the SS were not able to round anyone up, there was no one there. This during the summer, the previous summer, the SS were able to round up five thousand Jews every day uh, by enticing them to the Umschlagplatz, by fooling them, by lying to them, and uh, and 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 all kinds of other means. Now, everyone was hidden. There was no one around when the SS arrived in the ghetto. So essentially, the non-fighting population, which was the overwhelming majority, well more than 50,000 Jews, they were supporting the armed resistance just by disappearing, just by being hidden away in bunkers, and then also uh, hosting the fighters during the last weeks of the fighting inside their bunkers. Um, On April 19, 1943, which is the first day of Pesach, or the night of Pesach, I don't remember how it went, uh, night or the day, um, but the SS entered the ghetto to implement the final liquidation, the final deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto to the Treblinka death camp, the gas, the gas chambers. And, and they knew that this would be the final one. And, they, and the Jews in the ghetto knew that, the, that Treblinka meant the death camp. It was gas chambers, no selectia, no chance of survival. And that's why they were willing to throw everything in. There was, no, there was, there was nothing to risk anymore. All hope was lost. There was this sense of total desperation. And that was a very strong and clear understanding to the Jews in the ghetto. So the point is is that the uprising breaks out as a reaction to the SS entering the ghetto to deport the last Jews of Warsaw to Treblinka. The uprising doesn't break out in a spontaneous way to antagonize the SS, to fight against the SS on a random Tuesday, when all the SS wanted to do was keep the slave labor till the end of the war. That is the furthest thing from the truth. What happened was, is the SS are trying to go and implement the final deportation from the ghetto, the final liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto to the gas chambers in Treblinka. 
And in reaction to that, in response to the SS entering the ghetto to carry out this deportation, the uprising breaks out, the initial days of fighting, they kill some SS, they kill some Nazis, the Nazis have some losses, they retreat, they're not able to carry out a single deportation. They, it's a complete failure, the first several days. Jürgen Stroop, the SS um, officer um, who puts down eventually the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, he takes over, he decides to burn down the ghetto block by block, building by building. In fact, in the early days, the ZZW, the Revisionist Zionist Fighting Force, they ha- they raise two flags over a building at Maranovska Square in the center of the ghetto. The Jewish nationalist flag, which would later become the national flag of the state of Israel, and the Polish national flag, the red and white Polish national flag as a sign of Polish resistance. And Polish resistance fighters on the other side of Warsaw saw that, and they said, the Jews have raised our national flag before even we have over Warsaw. And that is a, an incredible testimony. So, and Stroop, Jürgen Stroop reacts to the flags. They, they, he couldn't hand, that was one of the, 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 the things they went crazy over. It took four days for them to get the flags shot down. There is a, a Stroop in his testimony describes a phone call from Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS in, uh, in Berlin. And he says, get those flags down. Do anything you can to get those flags down. Uh, a very interesting um, part of the story as well. Um, the uprising lasts for nearly a month, from April 19th to May 16th. Um, there was some sporadic fighting after that. Stroop's uh, counterattack was to simply burn down the entire ghetto and smoke everyone out of the bunkers. And this is the end of the uprising. There are some shootings inside the ghetto. Um, and then there's the final deportations of anyone who is taken out of the bunkers and isn't shot on the spot. They're, tri- to, they're deported to Treblinka, to the gas chambers, and also later on to Majdanek, uh, Majdanek um, the notorious horrible camp near Lublin, and also to some other camps from Majdanek to Travniki and to the Budzin, other, other smaller camps in the Lublin area. On May 8th, uh, a large bunker at Mila, uh, Mila Street, number 18, falls. That was the headquarters of the ZOB. Mordechai Nilevich and many other fighters commit suicide inside during the last moments as the SS is coming into the bunker. On May 10th, the Bund uh, leader, Shmuel Ziegelboim, who is the Bund representative in the Polish government in exile in London. He hears about the Warsaw Ghetto uprising and the uh, them dying fighting in the burning streets of Warsaw, and he decides to show solidarity with them, and he commits suicide, leaving behind a very terrifying and uh, note to the world, or like a condemnation of the world, of, of the silence, not helping the Warsaw Ghetto fighters and stopping the Nazis. Um, that was a that shook up a lot of people, Ziegelbaum's death. Um, and then in the last days of the uprising, Simcha Rotem, then known as Kajik, one of the fighters, he leads a group of fighters out through the sewers, uh, through the sewer system in Warsaw. An incredible story. Marek Edelman, Sivia Lubetkin, and other fighters are led out to the other side of Warsaw, where they join the Polish resistance. How many Germans were killed? So Jürgen Stroop, in his report, said 16, probably an underestimate. Marek Edelman, the Bundist leader of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, he estimated around 300, probably an overestimate. It probably is somewhere in between. That's what Yisrael Gutman, who is an Israeli historian, and also as a young teenager, a fighter in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, he says it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, so the, 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 um, the survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto, there were survivors, some survivors who survived Majdanek and survived the war. Um, some survivors who survived in hiding, um, very few, not that many survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto. So what are the basic misunderstandings? That's the, that's the story um, of, and that's not the story, it would take nine hours to tell the whole story, but that's a very, very, very quick bullet point summary of the story of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. What are some of the basic misunderstandings that I tried clarifying as I went along? I just want to speak them out. Um, the m- biggest misunderstanding I found just from listener feedback over the years on groups and then from the podcast was the was that the was that there's some misconception out there that the uprising was this spontaneous uprising to antagonize the SS to 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 die fighting the uprising was a reaction the rea- it was a reaction to the SS's attempt 
to at the final deportation. In other words, they knew they were going to their deaths at the gas chambers in Treblinka. The question is, would they go to their deaths, I don't know, in a few hours in Treblinka, in the gas chambers, or would they go to their deaths fighting in the ghetto? And to them it made no difference. And to them they said, hey, why not? Let's do it in the ghetto fighting. And for whatever reason they they had, you know, it just made, it gave them better feeling, it gave them a sense of strength, it gave them, they're taking some down with them, whatever each of their cheshbainas were. But it definitely was not to, it, it, it was not a, you know, out of nowhere, hey, let's uh, rise up against the SS. In the meantime, the SS are trying to keep uh, this, everyone, all the last Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto alive through slave labor. That's not what's happening. The SS are doing a final liquidation of the ghetto and sending them to Treblinka. And the uprising is a reaction to that. Um, that's a very, very important misunderstanding. Another misunderstanding I found was the the difference between the Ludge and Warsaw ghettos. Um, some survivor testimony and some uh, contemporary analysis, uh, not serious analysis, more like a polemic analysis, um, say, says, hey, look, the Warsaw ghetto, almost no one survived. And in Ludge, several thousand Jews survived. So, you know, what's the, what's the difference? The difference is in the Warsaw ghetto, there was an uprising and the Nazis killed everybody. Whereas in Ludge, there was no uprising, and therefore there are more survivors. So we see from here that it's better not to do an uprising, and therefore we can condemn the Warsaw Ghetto fighters that they should not have done an uprising, and, and people make it a religious thing, a religious against secular, they make it a Zionist thing. Um, so, I mean, first of all, it's not a religious and secular because they're religious fighters also. It's definitely not a Zionist thing because the resistance was composed of communists, Bundists, people who were not politically aligned altogether, as, a, as really nothing to do with Zionism. So, but again, in the 1950s, it was about Zionism. So let's make it about Zionism retroactively in the Warsaw Ghetto also. And then we can feel like we're doing something for history. So, so the, 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 a, the, the difference is very, very simple. The Ludge Ghetto had two very big differences between Warsaw and Ludge. Ludge Ghettos, first of all, it's leadership. In the Warsaw Ghetto, Adam Cherniakov, the head of the Judenrat, when he was ordered by Hermann Hoffley on July 22, 1942, that the Judenrat has to help with the SS with the roundup to, 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 for deportation, and of course Hoffley doesn't tell him where deportation was, but Cherniakov suspected the worst, Cherniakov commits suicide that night. He refuses to, to, to uh, cooperate with the SS. Um, whereas in the Ludge Ghetto, Chaim Rubinkovsky, Chaim Mordechai Rubinkovsky, the head of the Judenrat there, made a very controversial decision um, to say, hey, let's preserve at least people who can work in the Ludge Ghetto and we'll give the Nazis in 1942, when they were deporting the Jews from Ludge to Chelemno, to the gas vans there, um, he said those who can't work will be deported there and at least we'll preserve those who can work. And he created all these workshops, that textile workshops that made uniforms for the Wehrmacht, for the German army. So now Ludge ghetto workers are essential for the, for the war effort. So let's, you know, this way he, he tried to convince the SS to keep those remaining ones alive. So that's very two different stories. That's why there's more organized labor in the Ludge ghetto than in Warsaw. That's one difference. There was organized labor in the Schultz shops and some other shops, Tibbins uh, shops in the Warsaw Ghetto in its later stages as well. So that's not a huge difference, but I want to point that out anyway. The second difference is more fundamental, is that Ludge lay in an area that the Nazis had annexed to the Reich, called what they, what they named, they named, it was all part of Pol originally Poland, but they named it Wartgau, whatever these names mean. And Ludge is in this district. And that district had a different legal system as far as the Nazi occupying authorities were concerned and had a different um, way of treating the Jewish uh, question and the final solution. The general government, where Warsaw was, central Poland, was to be finally liquidated in that spring of 1943 with the approach of the Red Army. That was the direct order of Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS. 
So all ghettos in the general government, whatever was left, were to be completely liquidated. There was no order given for the ghettos in the Vartgau. Specifically, there was no order given for the Ludge ghetto, because I was in a different area, and they had their reasons, and they and there was of course this internal conflict between the Wehrmacht and the uh, and the SS, the Wehrmacht, the German army wanted. They, they weren't big friends of the Jews either, but they wanted the Jewish labor because after Stalingrad, they're losing the war, and they wanted the Jewish labor to continue making them uniforms in Ludge, and therefore they, 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 uh, they, they had that in Warsaw too, but in Warsaw there's a direct order from Himmler to liquidate everybody. Um, so they, 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 the, in the Wartgau, there is no uh, liquidation of Ludge, only when the Red Army comes closer to that area in August 1944, the last Jews of Ludge, including all these essential workers, are deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau, the last remaining death camp in operation in the summer of 1944. And of the last Jews of Ludge who are deported there, about 50,000 Jews from Ludge who are deported there, almost 90% are gassed in the Auschwitz gas chambers upon arrival, and uh, and uh, only about 5,000 Jews uh, unfortunately, uh, survived um, um, from that selexia and survived the war. Uh, so very few from Ludge survived as well. Um, so it's it's not it's not really a comparison Ludge and Warsaw. A better comparison I would make would be Warsaw to Lublin. Lublin is in the in the general government is in central Poland, and therefore Warsaw and Lublin are more comparable. And there's basically zero survivors from the Lublin ghetto. It's very, very rare. There's almost no survivors. Whereas from the Warsaw ghetto, there are several thousand survivors. Um, so that would be a much better comparison because the Ludge and Warsaw comparison is incomparable for the reasons I just described. Um, the next next, uh, next uh, thing I would add is a misunderstanding is that the going into the bunkers, these creating the bunker system, creating these underground places of hiding, of not being around as the Jews were in the summer previous summer, in the great deportation from the Warsaw Ghetto, the summer before, no one knew what Treblinka was, and people were around, and people and the SS were able to gather up uh, the Jews of the ghetto. Not not easily, but with relative ease. Here there was literally no one around. They could not find anyone. They were not able to find a single Jew to deport to Treblinka or Majdanek until they burned down the ghetto, block by bu- block, building by building, and people were forced to come out of their underground bunkers because they couldn't breathe because of the smoke. So the going into the bunkers was a way of supporting the uprising. It was a way of supporting the fighting. And then the, the next misunderstanding was the, who were the fighters? And like I said, they weren't just Zionists, they weren't just secular. There was communist, there was Bundist, there was religious, there was all types. Uh, Marek Edelman, the Bundist uh, leader of the revolt, he said the reason Anilevich, who was a Shomer Hatzair Zionist, the reason he was the he- head of the revolt, because he wanted to, so we just let him. It's not because they they were more important. He was more important uh, as a leader than anyone else was. Like I said, the previous head of the resistance was a communist uh, Jew. Um, another point to make is that there were other revolts, not in, only in Warsaw, and other ghettos. There are actually three revolts in death camps. One in Treblinka, August 3rd, 1942. One in Sobibor, October 14th, 1943. One in Birkenau, October 7th, 1944. Um, the Zunder commander revolt in Birkenau, where they blew up crematorium four. All of those three, and many of the ones in ghettos, were not political. They weren't along party lines. There was no politics involved. There was desperate Jews in a desperate situation, hopeless Jews in a hopeless situation, knowing that they're going to die anyway, and trying to do something. Trying to do something. So to politicize it, Unnecessarily, the idea of armed Jewish resistance against the Nazis is uh, is taking it a little bit out of the context of the time when it was really a desperate measure. Um, so that's that's important. And in that context, I just want to end off in honor of the 80th yard site of Rabbi Menachem Zemba. Um, Rabbi Menachem Zemba, I spoke about many you know, many episodes ago. I think it was three years ago about his role in the uprising, and there's this big 
everyone gets very emotionally engaged when they speak about this topic. Was Rabbi Menachem Zemba supportive of the fighting, of the armed resistance in the last stage or not? And everyone gets very touchy about this subject, and I've already covered it, so I don't want to get everyone uh, upset again. But there seems to be lots of corroborating testimony that he was in the last stage, not in the early stage, not in the Great Deportation the summer before when no one knew what it was. Um, I've had long email threads with listeners who've gotten very mad at me for saying that, so I'm apologizing in advance, but this is what it seems. The evidence seems to present itself pretty strongly. Rabbi Zemba, the important thing that I want to end with is he was one of the greatest leaders of Polish Jewry before the war, wrote many sforim, respected Talmud Chacham, one of the leaders of Agudas Yisrael, like I said, um, and he's the head of the Warsaw Bezdin from 1935 and on. And in the last stage of the Warsaw Ghetto, he's actually offered an opportunity to escape. He and a couple of other rabbis, Rav Shimshin Stockhammer and Rav David Kahana, um, Rav David Shapira, I'm sorry, Rav David Kahana was someone else, Um, Rav David Shapiro, uh, the last three rabbis of the Warsaw Ghetto, a Polish Catholic priest who wanted to save Jews, risk his life to save Jews, and he couldn't save everyone, obviously. So he said, I can save clergy. There's any clergy left in the ghetto. And he met with these three rabbis and made them an offer to be saved. And after conferring among themselves, Rabbi Nachem Zemba was the spokesman of the three. He said to him, we're going to have to turn down your very generous offer. You're risking your life on our behalf, but we're going to have to turn it down because we're still the rabbis of Warsaw. And the priest says, what do you mean? There is no community of Warsaw. There's no rabbinical duties to execute. There's no responsibilities. There's no communal life. There's no shuls. There's nothing left. What do you mean you're the rabbis of Warsaw? You can at least save yourselves now. There is no Jewish Warsaw left. And Menachem Zemba, in a very emotional response, he says to him, you're right. There's nothing for us to do for our community anymore, but there's one thing that we still can do, and that's be there with them. And that we can't take away from them. Being there with them in the last stages, we can still do that. And that's our responsibility as leaders and as rabbis, and we're going to choose to do so. So he gave up this opportunity to have his life saved, and instead he was in a bunker, and on a few days into the uprising, the bunker is filling up with smoke, and they decide to cross the street and go to um, a, a, a bunker across the street. He's carrying a grandchild, I believe. He was nearly 60 years old. He's 59 years old, I think. Born in 1883, and um, he's shot by a Nazi sniper as he crosses the street, um, and he's buried by his family in a smoking courtyard um, in the burning Warsaw Ghetto, and his body was discovered in 1958, when they're still clearing the rubble, 15 years after the uprising from the Warsaw Ghetto, his body was discovered in a temporary burial, and he's brought to Yerushalayim, and in a very big and public and emotional funeral, he's reburied on Haram Anuchis, where he is till today. And I bring on my Haram Anuchis tours, which you're welcome to join next time you're visiting Israel. I bring them to uh, bring to, we go pay our respects in Davin and tell the story of Menachem Zemba by his uh, gravesite on Haram Anuchis. And I always add to that, Menachem Zemba was one of the greatest and most important leaders of pre-war. Warsaw, pre-war Poland, which was the center of Jewish life. Warsaw was the center of the capital of the Jewish world. And he is killed in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, that last stand of Warsaw Jewry. And he gets to, he has the privilege to be buried in Yerushalayim, the new center of Jewish life um, of today, of, of, of the 21st century. And he's sitting there up on top of Armenuch, and with this beautiful, wonderful view of Yerushalayim. And he like kind of is able to hand over the torch from one pre-war center to the post-war center of Jewish life, and he serves as that bridge, and I always feel that that's a very fitting uh, book and ending to the tragic story of Rabbi Nachum Zemba and the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So, I hope this clarified a few things for everyone. This was Yehudi Geber with Jewish History Soundbites. You can reach me at Yehuda at YehudiGeber.com for questions, comments, sources, tours, trips, sponsorships, and lectures. You can subscribe to Jewish History Soundbites on your favorite podcast platform, and I hope you enjoyed.